The news these days is all coronavirus all the time. And as usual, there's a fair amount of unclear or straight up incorrect information out there. We've picked out what seems to be at the forefront of most people's minds so we could provide you with the most transparent answers possible with the currently available data. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Among all of the current unknowns of the COVID-19 pandemic, immunity remains among the most important. Are people immune after catching the virus? If so, for how long? We can test for antibodies, but when the test comes back positive, we don't know what that means for a patient's overall risk of reinfection. The general consensus is that immunity is likely. The virus doesn't appear to be mutating quickly, so existing antibodies should offer protection. The bigger question is how long that immunity can be expected to last. Evidence from other coronaviruses suggests that we may be able to expect months to years, but not lifelong as we see with viruses like chickenpox. Six years following SARS infection, a coronavirus we saw back in the early 2000s, antibodies appear to be absent, but other immune memory cells are present. The presence of those cells in mice protects against SARS infection, but whether they're protective against reinfection in humans is anyone's guess since we haven't had a reemergence of SARS. Other data suggest that people are repeatedly infected, even within the same year, with other coronaviruses known to cause common cold symptoms. It's too soon to know much with this new coronavirus, but we do have some data from animal studies. In one published on May 21st, monkeys previously infected with the virus were re-exposed to it after their initial recovery. The monkeys showed an enhanced immune response and did not get sick, suggesting that at this short time point, they did have an immune-mediated protection to the virus. In a second study, prototypes of COVID-19 vaccine were administered to 25 monkeys. Antibodies were later found in their blood, and when they were exposed to the virus, they didn't get sick, while 10 unvaccinated control monkeys did get sick upon exposure. These data are promising, but it's very important to remember that they are no guarantee of what we'll see in humans. Differences in symptoms are already apparent between monkeys and humans, so other differences may be expected as well. As helpful as animal studies are, we can't get too carried away when we interpret them. Monkeys are not humans. Another major item of concern has been multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children with COVID-19. This syndrome can cause inflammation in several organs, including the heart, lungs, and brain, and may also cause fever, rashes, chest pain, and changes in skin color and heart rate. While it can certainly be deadly, most children have recovered with appropriate medical care. My colleague, Dr. Jim Wood, a pediatric infectious disease specialist, reminds parents that this particular complication is rare, so no need to get overly worried, but healthcare professionals should be aware of the symptoms. We better talk about one more big topic that for a few unsavory reasons seems to endlessly circulate in the news, hydroxychloroquine. This drug is an anti-malarial used to prevent and treat malaria and also to treat autoimmune disorders like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. The results of a few questionable studies of the effectiveness of the drug against COVID-19 when combined with the antibiotic azithromycin spread like wildfire. Some of the less offensive outcomes of this included administration of this drug combination to patients in dire straits and with few other options. Some of the worst outcomes were people dying because they heard it would help and tried dosing themselves with no medical supervision. Doctors began to hoard the medicine and patients using it for its intended purpose were at risk of a shortage. The FDA even issued an emergency use authorization for patients hospitalized with COVID-19, though it still cautioned against widespread use due to the risk of heart rhythm problems. However, a recent study out of France reported no evidence of clinical benefit for this treatment when given to patients with severe COVID-19 infections. Another study published in The Lancet on May 22nd not only reported no benefit, it reported decreased in-hospital survival and increased frequency of ventricular arrhythmias. This is why experts like Dr. Anthony Fauci cautioned against the use of treatments before we have data, and so do we, because it's too easy to end up with an ugly answer to the question, what can it hurt? With such a new and rapidly evolving situation, it's hard to provide clear answers to anything right now. Sometimes we have no data yet, and sometimes we have data that are incomplete or come from poorly run studies or data that aren't yet readily translatable to humans. We have to remain vigilant, skeptical, and ready to change our minds if data so insists. We plan to continue doing all that here on Healthcare Triage, and we hope it's helpful to you as you attempt to navigate and unravel all the information out there. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy these other episodes where we answer your COVID-19 questions. 
It always helps if you like and subscribe down below. And another way you can help, if you can, is to go to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help support the show, make it bigger and better, and help us get through still filming in my office, although we hope to be back to the studio soon. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, and Josh Gister, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral Sam.